timeless, weightless, boundless. Discovering the most fascinating landscapes on Earth by hot air balloon. Five countries, four continents, 180 days. Up, up and away with Phil and Ali Dunnington, an Anglo-German couple whose goal is to discover the world by balloon. Breathtaking flights. Dramatic landings. Exotic cultures. Unexpected encounters. Lighter than air, the balloon floats aloft, bringing us closer to man's oldest dream. The dream of flying. Mongolia. For the first time, Phil and Ali Dunnington are heading for the skies above this fascinating country. As a professional tour guide, Ali knows Mongolia, but this expedition will be a first for her and her husband, Phil. Together with their crew and three other international ballooning teams, they are setting out on a journey of exploration through this enormous Central Asian country. Their aim is to conquer the skies where no hot air balloon has gone before. For three weeks, the four intrepid balloon teams will traverse the wide open spaces of Mongolia. More than 3,000 kilometers lie before them. A vast Gobi Desert, bleak rocky landscapes and grassy steppes. It is said that there are more horses in Mongolia than people, and certainly life for the locals here revolves around horses. 800 years ago, the Mongolian army conquered swathes of Asia and Europe on horseback. Their ruler, Genghis Khan, created the largest realm in history, with Mongolia as the center of his mighty empire. The glorious past has not been forgotten. The bronze Mongolian leader is still enthroned in front of the Houses of Parliament in the capital of Ulaanbaatar. Here, on the Great Square, is where our expedition members meet. They've traveled here from England, Germany, France and Switzerland. It has taken a whole year to prepare, organizing the transportation of four balloons halfway around the world and getting countless permits granted. Ulaanbaatar is a very modern city, even down to the daily traffic jams. Around one million people live here, a third of the total population of Mongolia. But the balloonists aren't really interested in city life. They are itching to get out to the steppes. There are eight vehicles in the convoy. It's the end of August. The rainy season is just over and the steps are green. True to tradition, herdsmen here work on horseback. But there are also much more modern forms of horsepower, like cars and motorbikes, parked next to their gears, the traditional round tent. Mongolia is huge, four times larger than Germany. With only three million inhabitants, the population density is extremely low, and there are vast distances between inhabited places.
a two-hour drive west of Ulaanbaatar, lies the starting point of their adventure. All the problems encountered in the run-up time are forgotten. Getting local aviation authorities to issue permits, the business of transporting the balloons, getting hold of the gas, and the long trips just to get here. The gentle rolling hills of the Hustai National Park offer Ali and the other pilots ideal conditions for their first exploratory flight. But balloonists don't just want to fly high. They also like to demonstrate their skills closer to the ground. Contour flying is almost an art, keeping the balloon floating just inches away from the ground. The pilots regulate the heat inside the balloon with blasts from the burner, making it rise or sink. But they can't actually steer in the conventional sense. Their direction is determined by the wind alone, and each balloon drifts to a different landing site. Ali is expecting a soft landing because of the light wind. The ground crew can follow them easily. They're waiting for her when she touches the ground. One hour, exactly. Fantastic. The Hustai National Park is famous for its rare Shavalsky horses. These wild horses originally roamed the entire Eurasian steppes. During the last century, they almost became extinct, but today they are successfully being released into the wild as part of a breeding program. A loud whistling pierces the air here. This is the groundhog's warning signal of imminent danger. Because enemies, like these eagles, lurk everywhere. The Mongolian gerbil is another favorite target for birds of prey. They have to be constantly vigilant. All their senses are primed for flight. A falcon searching for its prey. And the next predator is circling. This eagle won't be going hungry today. Bayan Gobi, a prairie paradise on the edge of the Gobi Desert. Known as yurts, or gears in Mongolian, these round tents are still the classic shelter for Mongolians, and they travel with them from one pasture to the next. This oasis between scrubby steppe and desert offers everything the herdsmen need, water and juicy grass. Bayangobi is today's destination for the balloonists. At the end of a four-hour journey in their minibuses, they are greeted by the sight of their accommodation. No comfortable hotel, but traditional Mongolian girls. Yeah, 
it's being towed, but it's only not far away. It's behind us. These felt-covered tents normally house an entire family. For tourists, these are double rooms. That's our gear. You're in number 29. Be careful what you had. Just step in. Let's go around and have a look. So, that's how it looks in a traditional Mongolian gear. Mm -hmm. Gear is the traditional Mongolian word for something like the home, yeah? yeah. And it can be assembled within an hour or two. Mm -hmm. And there's a special rule where women and men sleep. Mm -hmm. So, the women are always on the right side and the men are on the left side, yeah? Then you have a wonderful stove where we make fire in the evenings if it's cold. And if you have a special guest coming in, he will get the honorable seat right mm -hmm. in the middle here uh, near the fire to keep yeah. warm. So I hope you have a good time here. Yep. Settle in and I'll see you around and look after the other clients. Thank you very much. See you later. Bye -bye. Bye -bye. Okay. okay, I will stay on the right side. That's mine. Meanwhile, a storm has gathered outside. Ballooning is definitely out for today. Luckily, the center of the storm passes across the distant dunes. Heavy hail showers are common here, often turning the dunes white. The weather forecast for the following day looks promising. Only a few clouds and a light wind. Before takeoff, Phil Dunnington, the expedition leader, gives everyone a briefing. We'll need to set up um, a timing schedule and a series of options for the takeoff location tonight. Um, it's looking reasonably good at the moment. There are a couple of build-ups over there, but I think they're far enough away at the moment not to worry about. So we want to be in the air by no later than 6.30. So if we look at, say, 9 o'clock for dinner, that gives us just enough time to have a gin and tonic if we do fly, and lots of time to have lots of gin and tonics if we don't. <laughs> a large level area near their overnight accommodation is chosen as the takeoff location. That's it, good. First, the baskets must be equipped with burners and gas cylinders. Then, the balloon envelopes are laid out, pointing downwind. Using a fan, the balloon is first blown up with cold air. As soon as it is full, Phil starts heating the air with a burner. Only then does the balloon become light enough to take off. It is still tethered to one of the vehicles to stop it from flying off on its own while Phil is making other preparations. I'm sure he can handle the horse if it does get <laughs> The balloon towers more than 20 meters above them. When the temperature inside the balloon reaches over 90 degrees centigrade, it develops enough lift to carry three passengers through the air. Phil takes off first. His balloon will be accompanied some of the way by riders, so Phil initially stays close to the ground. He has never had an escort like this before. Horses are generally terrified of the hissing balloon monsters in the sky. During takeoff, Phil has to keep an eye simultaneously on height, wind and terrain. No easy job. Down here, look. 
I think I'm going to be landing very shortly because otherwise we'll be right in the middle of all these uh, sand dunes and the area ahead looked very wet so uh, I'm going to be descending for a, a landing in probably the next five or ten minutes. Are you talking to the other balloon? Peter, Phil, I've got 50 degrees of right up here. Oh, hopeless. What happened? Well, Peter said if you climb, you'll get more left, and I've gone up and I've got 50 degrees of right. Phil's balloon is drifting in a different okay, direction well, to the one he had planned. This time it's not really a problem because the wind is making his balloon drift quite slowly and the ground teams can still follow him easily. Not normally I'm scared of heights, you know. I'm scared of um, looking down from our balcony at home. But here I'm so much higher and I just don't have any fear and it's just amazing. It's just a different world, completely. Oh, wow. Goyo Radna Bazaar is the group's interpreter. This is her first balloon flight. We're uh, descending now for final landing on the track, uh, which is about 500 metres down that track left off the main route. To prevent the balloons from being driven towards the inaccessible dunes, or even the swamps behind them, the pilots decide to land. It was just a short flight, and the horseback riders had no problem keeping up over the five-kilometer stretch. Phil manages a perfect landing. One of the best that I've ever done in terms of visibility and the interest of the ground below and the people and everything, so really superb and a great beginning to our huge adventure here in in um, uh, Mongolia. The convoy of balloonists, with all their kit and caboodle, sets off towards the northeast. They're heading for the Tsenkha Valley and the Kangai Mountains. There aren't many paved roads around here. Our travelers have to ford rivers, avoid muddy trails, and negotiate bumpy stretches. Not all of them make good progress. They take a break. The truck with the gas bottles is missing. It seems as if the um, gas truck went to the wrong camp and uh, it's trying to cut across country to get to the correct camp and in doing so got stuck in the river. So now we're looking to see if we can find where it is because it needs two vehicles to tow it out. We're just having a look to see if we can identify where on the route it is stuck in the mud. At last, the search is successful. <laughs> There's not much they can do without help. But with the driver's experience and the combined efforts of the others, the problem is quickly solved. However, the group only reaches the camp right at the end of the Tsenkha Valley after sunset. Next day, the balloonists are up at dawn. They have to get everything set up quickly.
the pilots are hoping for a drainage wind to carry them along the valley. This is only possible early in the morning when the cool air from the mountains blows down the slopes. Later during the day, the winds become too thermic and unpredictable. Tour guide Togi Erdene will join them in the basket today. He is apparently not very happy about the idea, though his colleagues envy him. Togi, Togi play. Maybe next time never play. <laughs> today, Togi will be initiated into the circle of balloonists, together with his colleague Oyuna. Once pilot Richard Gieselink has explained the safety regulations to them, they're ready to go. All the balloons are ready before sunrise. Richard takes off first. Next, it's Ali's turn. Then the Swiss pilot, Adrian Held. They're all aloft in time to greet the rising sun. As planned, the wind blows the balloons quickly down the valley. The ground team in the 4x4 minibus tries to keep them in sight because once the balloons have started, there's no going back. Every balloon has a ground crew with its own vehicle. They keep in touch with the pilots by walkie-talkie. The early start was worth it. The wind is ideal, carrying the balloons at just the right speed down the Tsenkher Valley. As long as the balloons are still heading down the valley, the pilots can relax and enjoy the view. But it doesn't stay as straightforward as that. The Swiss balloon starts to drift slowly over side valleys. Their ground crew has a tough time following them. Once visual contact has been lost, it's nearly impossible to reach the balloon by radio too. The ground crew has to find a hill that's accessible with their 4x4. Then they have to wait for a response from the balloon's pilot. <laughs> Meanwhile, Ali's following team has reached the designated landing site. It wasn't easy to find a good place in the somewhat confusing terrain, but Ali manages a precision landing here too. It was fantastic. Yes, yeah, okay. It was Amazing. lovely. She enjoyed it. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. <laughs> Adrian is still in the air. His ground crew can't find him in the maze of tributary valleys. Adrian is getting a little anxious. He wants to land, but the terrain here is anything but ideal. The wind starts to pick up, blowing them towards the trees. He has to ascend again. Okay. Adrian, catch me. While his team is searching for him. Adrian tries to come down again. This time, it has to work. 
at the same place where Ali landed, preferably. All of a sudden, the wind gets stronger. Adrian's balloon finds the only tree for miles around. The envelope has to be brought down as quickly as possible, so the balloon can come to a standstill. Also, das äh, war so. Wir sind relativ schnell gewesen und das war ein kleines Stück, wo man landen konnte. Ich wollte nicht weiter. Deshalb haben wir den Baum genutzt, um zu bremsen. Das ist ein normales Manöver beim Ballonfahren. A good reason to pop a couple of corks. We come to the very noblesse. As dictated by its aristocratic past and the tradition of ballooning, Togi and Ayuna are elevated to the ballooning aristocracy. Ballonists, the noblesse society of ballonists. You know, the god of the ballonists brought us from Earth up in the high skies, some fire. <laughs> Nice smoke. <laughs> you have to honor. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> you get the Baptize you in the name and you called from now on Freiherr von Zante Kabar. Congratulations. Okay. <laughs> These pastors the grazing lands for sheep, goats, cattle and horses. The animals govern the nomadic lives of the herdsmen. It's late afternoon. The balloonists have changed their mode of transport. They have been invited to the home of a nomadic family to share their evening meal. That afternoon, a sheep was slaughtered. Now, everyone pitches in to help with the preparation. Traditional Mongolian cuisine revolves around meat. Vegetables are rare. In the kitchen tent, the fire is lit. Mongolians don't grill their meat, they boil it, so that none of the precious fat content is lost. <laughs> If you can just mount a satellite dish outside the living room tent, moving is easy. But only a third of the Mongolian population lives a nomadic life. Goyo, the interpreter, explains the meaning of airag. Soured mare's milk is part of their basic diet, as is cheese. See how their milk. Sharing is um, everything in Mongolia. Yeah. Is um, yeah, I did just Thank said, you. you can get up to Every visitor is greeted by the lady of the house offering airag. This family is very lucky to be in a beautiful location, nice. There's a water there, you know, trees, uh, enough grazing, and they don't have huge amount of huge need of moving. So this family just moves twice a year, um, and they would put, put more felt and more covers and more carpets. Meat for the Mongolians and additional vegetables, especially for their guests. The food is served from a large pot and put on the table. It has been an eventful day. They all enjoy the food, the hospitality, and the company.
the journey continues. Their next goal is the Gorky Terelj National Park. Mongolian roads are a punishing challenge for any vehicle. The drivers are used to fixing flat tires. Meanwhile, the balloonists want to start setting up. Ominous clouds start to gather in the sky. The pilots decide against flying, except for Ali. The well-coordinated team manages to get the balloon ready for takeoff within half an hour. Ali didn't want to miss this flight for anything. After all, it is a pioneering flight. Wow, the first time a hot air balloon has ever flown in Gorky Terelj Natural Park. Gorky Terelj lies at 1,600 meters above sea level in the Kenti Mountains. Because of its alpine nature, the area is often called the Switzerland of Mongolia. The hilly grasslands are highly prized pastures for the nomads. In summer, the place is swarming with itinerant farms. Not to mention numerous tourist camps. The National Park is especially famous for its unusual rock formations. A nomad's wealth is his animals, whether they are livestock or domestic pets. Ali searches for a favorable wind direction at various altitudes. She doesn't want to be driven into the mountains, but equally wants to avoid inaccessible and marshy areas too. Despite the apparent glut of open spaces, it's not at all easy to find a suitable landing site where her crew can also retrieve her. At last, Ali drops anchor. The crew is waiting for her. With their help, the balloon can be towed to a suitable landing site. observe the unusual visitors with typically Mongolian calm.
After every balloon flight, the gas cylinders are refilled. The gas truck is fully laden. After all, these supplies have to last for the entire trip. Propane gas is pumped from big containers on the truck into the smaller bottles for the balloons. When white vaporized gas escapes from the cylinder, it's full. A full gas cylinder weighs around 30 kilograms. Loading them safely in place in the individual balloon baskets before every flight is a tiring job. And it's not without hazards either. The bottles are highly pressurized. When a pipe bursts, it can be pretty scary. This time, no damage is done. All is well, and they can soon carry on. The journey continues through a natural crane habitat. Swampy lowlands lure the birds here in summer. The balloon teams eventually reach Karkorin, one of the larger provincial towns. A little market provides nomads from near and far with their daily requisites. <laughs> it's for the woman and... Uh... Warm clothing and boots are the most important. Followed by tack for their horses, portable stoves, <laughs> pots and everything else one might need for a life out in the steppes. Outside the little town lies the Buddhist temple compound of Erdene Zoo. It was built from the ruins of the nearby city of Karakorum, the 13th century center of power of the medieval Mongolian Empire. Around 1930, the Stalinist rulers raised the monastery almost to the ground. Only three temples survived the communist era. Now we can see that, that there is a middle one is Tatuin, who is the Buddha Shakyamuni when he was the young. These three remaining temples are not only an important Buddhist center, they are also a great tourist attraction. And there is a left side is on the wall painting is Buddha his living activities and uh, about the, his history of the mind. The balloonists are about to be given a great privilege. Two of the four balloons are granted permission to launch from within the temple walls. An unusual experience also for the monks. The compound, once again, has more than 70 of them living there. Outside the walls, Phil and Ali prepare for their flight. They want to launch at the same time as the other balloons and float over the temple compound together. Load up. But there's a delay. Adrian's balloon is still on the ground and the wind has changed. Now both basket and balloon have to be okay. repositioned so that they are once again pointing downwind, or the balloon envelope will roll uncontrollably from side to side while it is being inflated. With the full gas cylinders in it, the basket is heavy, and the semi-inflated envelope pulls at the ropes. 
die Windrichtung hat 90 Grad gedreht. Das ist relativ selten, aber das konnten wir jetzt so einfach handeln, weil wir so viele nette Mönche als Helfer haben, wo wir den ganzen Korb so einfach umplatzieren konnten. Wenn du natürlich nur mit drei, vier Leuten bist, musst du unter Umständen vielleicht die Luft völlig rauslassen und dann neu starten. Das ging jetzt so einfach, weil eben alle mitgeholfen haben. At last, they're ready. The balloons outside the temple walls start first. Adrian can launch now too, thanks to the monk's energetic help. But the balloonists' plan to float directly over the historic temple compound doesn't work out. Because the wind changed, they only managed to drift past one side of it. But even so, the balloonists still get a unique view. The balloonists float over the town of Kakorin and onwards towards the mountains. I pulled the top out of the balloon to let some air out because I want to come down reasonably quickly because I don't want to end up on those mountains and we will do it this way. Phil and Ali use the opportunity to descend and take a closer look at the town. From above, you can see that Mongolians prefer living in gears, even in towns and villages. These versatile round tents are more than just comfortable and airy. They can also be packed up and taken away when the yearning for the steps gets too strong. The pilots have to land just beyond the town. The sun is going down, and no one wants to be still airborne in darkness. The unusual flying objects attract a lot of attention. Soon half the town is on its way to the place where the balloons have landed. The children are especially curious. And after Adrian allows several of them to climb into the basket, there's no holding them back. Bye bye. The chance to take off in a hot air balloon is something no one wants to miss, and Adrian fulfills their wish. Till late in the evening. Next day, the group heads for the desert. The landscape here is drier and starker. But even in the bleak, stony mountain territory, there is still life to be found. Camels do well here. and all kinds of little animals live in between the rocks. Pikas can make do with very little and are quite happy in this forbidding landscape. The rock fissures give them safe shelter from their predators. It still seems amazing that they managed to survive, despite the scarcity of vegetation.
Hour after hour, the convoy of vehicles keeps moving. A spring with water that's potable for both humans and animals becomes an unintended rest area. The gas truck has a leaky tank. Apparently, travelers stop here often. There's even a souvenir shop selling mostly local products, stones and bones collected in the area by nomads. Makeshift repairs have soon been completed and the convoy can continue. After a 10-hour journey, they arrive. They have reached the camp in the middle of the Gobi Desert. The only thing they all want to do right now is sleep. Shortly after sunrise, the group is already on its way to a balloon flight over the sand dunes of the Gobi Desert. The pilots check whether the wind direction and strength are favorable. 7.5, 8, 8.6, uh, that's just rubbish. Yeah. A wind velocity of 15 kilometers an hour with strong gusts. That's too much to take off in a balloon. The crew decides to wait until the wind dies down. A bit later, Ali decides to give it a try. Helpers spread out a cloth to protect against the sand. Even though the gusts aren't that strong anymore. Okay, well, we'll give it a try. I'm not very confident that it will work. But. Okay. Good. It looks like it's going to work. But the wind soon picks up again. Everything is still going to plan. Once the air is heated and the balloon aloft, Ali will have won. The gusts pull and rip at the balloon's envelope. The big balloon can't be controlled any longer. Phil pulls the rip line, opening the parachute, the top end of the envelope. Hot air escapes and the situation is under control. Sorry. <laughs> nice try. Nice try, yeah. And that was it. No, it's just too gusty. Right, that showed you when not to inflate a balloon. It's just too gusty <laughs> and uh, it wasn't meant to be. The wind isn't the only problem the balloonists have to face. Sand is just as much of a hindrance, especially when it comes to moving on.
and they definitely want to move on. Out into the desert to a better place to launch their balloons. They have to have at least one more successful flight. Everyone knows what they're supposed to do. It all goes like clockwork. And off they go. The terrain is ideal. And takeoff conditions perfect. Arid steps, as far as the eye can see. All the stress and frustrations of the past three weeks seem to just melt away. For one last time, they can marvel at the sheer endless expanses of Mongolia. On they fly, until sunset, and well beyond.